who opened the valve. Where are we in terms of that? The operator's name was Jose, and he was given this assignment to open the valve at 10 o'clock at night. And they <clears throat> ignored the alarm for an hour and a half? That's no. it? Nearly one million liters of oil waste was dumped by ARCO into the sewage system on that occasion. Alarms went off at the treatment plant and at ARCO, warning of high explosive levels. The plant was forced to close, releasing more than one billion liters of partially treated sewage into the Pacific Ocean. Samples taken after that spill were analyzed for toxicity at the Strike Force lab to see if there was a case for criminal prosecution of ARCO. Here, Roger Baird gathered the data that were used later in court. This is a comparison of two solvent extracts of oil samples. One of the oil samples is uh, a sample taken from a suspected dumper, and the other is from a sample taken out of one of our treatment plants that the oil was discharged to. Uh, the top one is the uh, uh, treatment plant sample, and the bottom one is the oil sample that was taken from the uh, suspected uh, discharger, and uh, they're identical proving that the suspect samples came from the refinery. One test for toxicity uses live fish. Their survival rate is monitored in tanks containing the suspect sample, diluted 2,000 times. The sample is toxic if half the fish die within 96 hours. The ARCA oil sample showed a fairly rapid die off of the fish. Um, we had nearly half the fish die in the first 24 hours of the test. Arco pleaded no contest to the charges against it, and it was slapped with over one million dollars in fines and costs. As part of this settlement, Arco had to set up a $450,000 scholarship fund for UCLA graduate students to study environmental sciences. Today's technology enables us to detect the minutest traces of toxic chemicals in our environment. So it's not difficult to find evidence that someone is polluting. What we lack is the will to prosecute them for it. In Canada, pollution doesn't fall under the criminal code. Ontario has drafted some progressive legislation and now leads the country in enforcement. But even in this province, the law fails to cover the 12,000 industries that dump into the city sewers. One Toronto electroplater dumped cancer-causing chemicals into the city sewers for 22 years even though he was convicted and fined over 60 times, he continued to dump. Eventually, a judge sentenced him to jail for contempt of court, not for pollution. And even that was overturned on a technicality. So what does it take to get environmental legislation with teeth? In California, it took a coalition of determined citizens and environmental groups. Under California law, citizens with enough signatures can petition to put a law on the ballot for a vote. That was how the toxics proposition got on the ballot without passing through the hands of the politicians. Proposition 65, the Safe Drinking Water and Toxics Enforcement Act, forces the governor to publish a list of all chemicals known to cause cancer or birth defects. Industry must prove that any detectable amounts of these chemicals that reach water supplies are not harmful. Warning labels are now required on any foods and products containing these chemicals. Now the burden of proof is on industry to show that its operations are not harming the public. Proposition 65 prohibits dumping into the water of the more than 200 carcinogens that are on the governor's list. Government employees must immediately warn the public and the media whenever there is illegal disposal that could harm the public or face prosecution. Fines and jail sentences against polluters are doubled. A citizen can sue government if it fails to prosecute a polluter and can collect part of any fine. Half of those fines must also go towards the cleanup of dumps. there was massive and fierce opposition from industry. The big oil, chemical, and high-tech industries raised more than $5 million to fight the initiative, and Chevron Oil alone contributed nearly a quarter of a million dollars.
Hollywood film community rallied in support of the initiative. Film stars joined the campaign to raise money and register voters. They organized high-profile events and visited cities where toxic disasters had occurred. The Hollywood clean water caravan made toxics the number one issue of the governor's race. We were a busload of scientists, you know, traveling around California talking about Proposition 65 and, and the dangers of, of putting poison, toxic chemicals into our water. We wouldn't necessarily attract this much attention. The environmentalists carried the day and the initiative won by a landslide. It will send a message to the government bureaucrats that are in charge of these kinds of problems that if they knowingly conceal information that, is, that relates to public health and safety, knowingly conceal, they will be subjected to felony prosecution and forfeiture of their office within 30 days of conviction. Uh, that is a very necessary provision because, as you know or may know, the Santa Monica Bay is just one example of a major natural resource, a beautiful natural resource, that is so seriously contaminated now as to be considered a sink. And that's because for years, perhaps as many as 30 years, public officials knowingly allowed the discharge of industrial and domestic waste to go into that unchallenged. In spite of tougher laws, we are still using archaic methods to dispose of our industrial waste. The BKK landfill on the outskirts of LA is typical of a problem that's plaguing the whole continent. Here, people that live in the immediate area here were being subjected to methane gas and vinyl chloride gas, which uh, is a natural byproduct of a landfill. Gases were coming up in the people's uh, sewers, in their toilets. Um, gas pockets would develop in their yards. Homeowners here feared for their health and their lives. After five years of legal battles, they finally settled a multi-million dollar lawsuit against BKK. One of these residents was Alan Cunijaro with lawyer Catherine Graham. We were told that this landfill would be turned into a golf course and that a natural wildlife reserve that was here would be preserved. When we first moved in seven years ago, the hill that's behind us, you can basically see, uh, was no higher than the rooftop. Uh, what's occurred there and the material that you now see uh, has been raised about 350 feet in the last two or three years. And I have yet to see one fairway and one green. There's been a tremendous odor problem here. There have been health problems, including nausea, headache, eye and skin irritation, upper respiratory problems, joint aches, body aches, um, irritability, uh, which are common ailments found around landfills and uh, common ailments uh, found uh, to chemical exposure per se. In addition, we have people with more serious problems, including cancer and miscarriages and stillbirths. When you consider the fact that there's somewhere between 700 million and a billion liquid gallons of toxic waste up there, uh, there's going to be many, many years of cleanup involved in and a closure plan, and there's going to be a lot of people stuck in these homes who are unable to sell them and exposed daily to what's ever coming out of the dump, whether you can smell it or not. The EPA estimates there are 55,000 dangerous landfills in the U.S., and more than three-quarters of them are leaking. The legacy of waste disposal has become a tragic game of musical chairs. One and a half billion tons are moved every year in the United States, half of it by truck, some of it clear across the country. Meanwhile, L.A. is running out of space to put the stuff. In L.A. County alone, four landfill sites have closed in the past five years, and no new sites have opened. The waste from L.A. now goes to landfills over 200 kilometers away. Costs keep going up, the amount of illegal disposal keeps increasing, and the hazards to people's health are devastating. But does it have to be that way, especially with all the warnings we've had? The Toxic Waste Strike Force down there in California has shown dramatically what can be done simply by a determined effort to enforce the law against polluters. As Barry Groveman, the man who prosecuted the first cases, says, it's not a difficult example to follow. We were just the first on the scene, and we led the way. We combined it with a little creativity. I mean, there's no magic here. There's nothing here that cannot and should not be duplicated everywhere. 
that's why I guess I grow a little impatient that we're not seeing it catching on a little faster. There's no great funding here. There's no magical financial answer. We don't have any greater resources, despite what people think. And we certainly don't have a bigger problem than everybody else does everywhere else in the world. We simply had the commitment, the heart, and the will to do something about it here, and that must catch on. The Nature of Things with David Suzuki will be right back with How Fish Swim. Watching fish move is hypnotic. When I was in high school, I wanted to become an ichthyologist, someone who studies fish. And I think the main reason was because they're so much fun to watch. They've evolved wonderful mechanisms to survive and move in a watery environment. But just how do fish swim? Do different species swim in different ways? What are the mechanical constraints imposed on the fish by the liquid environment? Aristotle was one of the first people to ask these questions. But it's only been in the past few decades that scientists have developed the techniques to actually get some answers. There are over 20,000 species of fish, and they live in a strange and diverse wilderness. The waters of the earth provide many different habitats each one with unique opportunities. As various species evolved, they developed special physical tools to meet the demands of their environment. For most fish, the fundamental skill of life is the ability to move, and much of the design of evolution has concentrated on swimming efficiency. The shape and fin configuration of a fish is its most distinctive characteristic. Scientists believe there is a direct relationship between the design of a fish and the way it lives. They divide fish movement into three categories. The first is cruising, steady high-speed swimming. Ranging across enormous tracts of ocean, tuna are masters of high-velocity endurance swimming. The second is acceleration, this is the adaptation that makes pike powerful and effective predators. When an unsuspecting prey swims within range of a pike's hiding place, it rarely escapes. The third is maneuverability. Banded butterfly fish are capable of precise low-speed movements that suit them to life in the nooks and crannies of a coral reef. The scientific notion that the design of an animal is directly related to the way it lives is not new. But it's only in the last 20 years that ichthyologists have been able to make detailed studies of the biomechanics of fish. What they're discovering is that fish use a surprising variety of hydrodynamic designs using many different principles of physics. With fish, nature proves to be a master engineer. At the University of Michigan, Paul Webb studies the biomechanics of swimming fish. It's a field of study that has advanced rapidly in the past 20 years with the development of technologies that allow scientists to use high-speed photography. He uses a flume, the aquatic equivalent of a wind tunnel. A pump creates a current in the chamber, and the fish remains stationary by swimming against the flow of water. A mirror mounted below gives a bottom view. With the photographs and mathematical models of the swimming motion, scientists are able to use computers to unravel the mysteries of the mechanics of swimming. This is a trout. It propels itself by passing an undulatory wave along its body. As the wave travels down the fish's body, it pushes against the water to the back and to the side. Pushing from this position, 
the wave will create a force in this direction. 